Welcome to the module for operations in cold weather conditions. Safe winter operations require special procedures by airline maintenance, engineering, flight crews, and de-icing personnel. Flight crews need to be aware of these procedures to include de-icing, anti-icing, cold weather maintenance, and flight operations. This module discusses recent developments for winter operations. Intended for flight crews, it provides guidance for cold weather operations procedures. This module also outlines general concepts and tips on safe winter operations. In this module, we will discuss the general operating considerations for cold weather operations. We'll look at the duties of the maintenance and ground staff, including the de-icing staff, during winter operations. We'll discuss the flight crew responsibilities during each phase of flight, including prior to taxi, during taxi, takeoff, descent, and landing. The procedures we will be discussing are general guidelines. Please refer to your airline's operating manual for specific procedures. Airplane operation in cold weather conditions can cause special problems because of the effects of frost, ice, snow, slush, and low temperature. The airplane maintenance manual provides procedures for removal of contaminants from the airplane and the prevention of subsequent accumulation of frost, ice, snow, or slush. In addition, the airline must ensure that the maintenance procedures for winter operations are appropriate for the weather conditions. Maintenance and ground staff need to be aware of how frequently airplanes are being de-iced or anti-iced and be aware that damage may occur to flight controls, landing gear, tires, and carbon brakes. The clean airplane concept describes an airplane that is aerodynamically clean, that is, free of frozen contaminants. The clean airplane concept is important because airplane takeoff performance is based upon clean surfaces until liftoff. An airplane is designed using the predictable effects of airflow over clean wings. Contaminants such as frost, ice, or snow adhering to the wings disturb this airflow, resulting in reduced lift, increased drag, increased stall speed, potentially severe roll problems due to uneven lift, and possible abnormal pitch characteristics. Aircraft manufacturers and regulators have determined that flight crews may not take off an aircraft when frost, ice, or snow is adhering to the wings, control surfaces, engine inlets, or other critical surfaces of the aircraft. Takeoff with frost under the wing in the area of the fuel tanks may be authorized by your country's regulators. Please check your regulations. It is also prohibited to dispatch or take off any time conditions are such that frost, ice, or snow may reasonably be expected to adhere to the airplane unless the airline has an approved ground de-icing, anti-icing program in its operation specifications that includes holdover timetables. Winter or cold weather operations are generally associated with a combination of low temperatures and frost, ice, slush, or snow on the airplane, ramps, taxiways, and runways. The airline flight manual defines icing conditions as when the outside air temperature, OAT, on the ground or total air temperature, TAT, in flight is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius or less, and any of the following exist. Visible moisture, in other words, clouds, fog with visibility of one statute mile, 1600 meters, or less, rain, snow, sleet, or ice crystals, ice, snow, slush, or standing water on the ramps, taxiways, or runways. Flight crews should carefully inspect areas where surface snow, ice, or frost could change or affect normal system operations. Perform a normal exterior inspection, 
with increased emphasis on checking surfaces, pitot probes, and static ports, air conditioning inlets and exits, engine inlets, fuel tank vents, landing gear doors, landing gear truck beam, brake assemblies, and APU air inlets. All leading edge devices, all control surfaces, the horizontal tail, vertical tail, and upper surface of the wing must be free of snow, ice, and frost. Perform the normal engine start procedures, but note that oil pressure may be slow to rise. Displays may require additional warm-up time before engine indications accurately show changing values. Displays may appear less bright than normal. Engine anti-ice must be selected on immediately after both engines are started, and it must remain on during all ground operations, when icing conditions exist or are anticipated. Do not rely on airframe visual icing cues before activating engine anti-ice. Use the temperature and visible moisture criteria. Check the flight controls and flaps to ensure freedom of movement. If there are any questions as to whether the airplane has frozen contamination, request de-icing or proceed to a de-icing facility. Never assume that snow will blow off. There could be a layer of ice under it. It is recommended during winter operations to use all engines during taxi. Allowing greater than normal distances between airplanes while taxiing will aid in stopping and turning in slippery conditions. This will also reduce the potential for snow and slush being blown and adhering onto the airplane or engine inlets. Taxi at a reduced speed. Taxiing on slippery taxiways or runways at excessive speed or with strong crosswinds may cause the airplane to skid. Use smaller nose wheel steering and rudder inputs. Limit thrust to the minimum required. If the taxi route is through ice, snow, slush, or standing water, or if precipitation is falling with temperatures below freezing, taxi out with the flaps up. Taxiing with the flaps extended subjects the flaps and flap devices to contamination. During taxi in, after landing on a contaminated runway, flight crews should consider leaving flaps extended to prevent damage before ground personnel can inspect the flaps. If you have de-iced, be aware of your holdover times. Do the normal before takeoff procedure. Extend the flaps to the takeoff setting at this time if they have not been extended because of slush, standing water, icing conditions, or because of de-icing or anti-icing. Consider the aircraft performance if operating on a contaminated runway. This will be discussed during the contaminated runway module. Verify that airplane surfaces are free of ice, snow, and frost before moving into position for takeoff. After setting takeoff power, check that engine indications are normal, in agreement, and in the expected range. Check that other flight deck indications are also normal. Rotate smoothly and normally at VR. Do not rotate aggressively when operating with de-icing, anti-icing fluid. Retract the flaps at the normal flap retraction altitude and on the normal speed schedule. A larger temperature difference from International Standard Atmosphere, ISA, results in larger altimeter errors. Check your airline guidance and Jeppesen charts for further guidance. Anticipate the need for activating the engine and or wing anti-ice systems at all times, especially during a descent through instrument meteorological conditions or through precipitation. When anti-ice systems are used during descent, be sure to observe your operating manual, anti-ice, and engine limitations. The flight crew must be aware of the condition of the runway with respect to ice, snow, slush, or other contamination. Consider landing performance and runway conditions, and consult your performance manual to determine stopping distances. 
Do not guess. Follow the normal procedures for approach and landing. Arm the auto brake and auto spoiler systems if available before landing. The airplane should be firmly flown onto the runway at the aiming point. Immediately after main gear contact with the runway, deploy the speed brakes if not already deployed by the automatic system. Without delay, lower the nose wheel to the runway to gain nose wheel directional control. Do not hold the nose gear off the runway when operating on slippery or icy runways. Use of auto brakes is recommended. They will allow the pilot to better concentrate on directional control of the airplane. If manual braking is used, apply moderate to firm, steady pedal pressure symmetrically until a safe stop is assured. Let the anti-skid system do its work. Do not pump the brake pedals. Do not use asymmetric reverse thrust on an icy or slippery runway unless necessary to arrest a skid. When using reverse thrust, be prepared for a possible downwind drift on a slippery runway with a crosswind. During winter operations, it is even more important than usual that the flight crew not attempt to turn off the runway until the airplane has slowed to taxi speed. Continue to use the engine anti-ice system during all ground operations when icing conditions exist or are anticipated. De-icing and anti-icing training. In this module, we'll introduce de-icing and anti-icing concepts and procedures. We will begin with an introduction to aircraft de-icing and anti-icing, the clean aircraft concept, contamination checks, de-icing procedures, and anti-icing fluids, methods and procedures, holdover times, and pre-takeoff checks. A very small amount of roughness in thickness as low as 0.36 millimeters or 1 64th of an inch caused by ice, snow, or frost disrupts the airflow over the lift and control surfaces of an aircraft. The consequences of this roughness are severe lift loss and impaired maneuverability. Ice can also interfere with the movement of aircraft control surfaces and or add significantly to aircraft weight. There is no such thing as an insignificant amount of ice on an aircraft. Therefore, if a contamination check determines the airplane has ice, frost, or snow, the aircraft must be de-iced before takeoff. If the aircraft is not clean prior to takeoff, it has to be de-iced. De-icing procedures ensure that all the contaminants are removed from aircraft surfaces. If the outside conditions may lead to an accumulation of precipitation before takeoff, the aircraft must be de-iced. Anti-icing procedures provide protection against the accumulation of contaminants during a limited time frame, referred to as holdover time. The clean airplane concept describes an airplane that is aerodynamically clean, that is, free of frozen contaminants. The clean airplane concept is important because airplane takeoff performance is based upon clean surfaces until liftoff. An airplane is designed using the predictable effects of airflow over clean wings. Contaminants such as frost, ice, or snow adhering to the wings disturb this airflow, resulting in reduced lift, increased drag, increased stall speed, potentially severe roll problems due to uneven lift, and possible abnormal pitch characteristics. During pre-flight, both flight crews and ground crews should conduct an aircraft contamination check. This check shall include a visual inspection of the complete aircraft, paying close attention to the control surfaces. Any contamination found shall be removed by a de-icing treatment. On some aircraft, a small amount of frost is allowed under the wing fuel cells. Please refer to your company 
and aircraft manuals for guidance on acceptable underwing frost. If anti-icing is also required, this treatment may be performed as a one-step combined de-icing anti-icing procedure or a two-step de-icing procedure then anti-icing procedure. There are currently four different de-icing and anti-icing fluid types. These fluids are called type 1, 2, 3, and 4. The compound of each individual certified fluid varies, but the types are known and accepted all over the world. The coloring of these fluids is also standardized. Currently, orange is the color for type 1 fluids. Type 2 and 3 fluids are yellowish, and green is the color for type 4 fluids. Some of the fluids are used for de-icing of aircraft, and others are used to anti-ice the aircraft. Sometimes the de-icing and anti-icing fluids can be applied in a one-step process that both de-ices and anti-ices the aircraft at the same time. De-icing fluid performance is measured by holdover time, HOT or HOT, which is the length of time an aircraft can wait after being treated prior to takeoff. Holdover time is influenced by the ambient temperature, wind, precipitation, humidity, aircraft skin temperature, and other factors. For type 1 fluids, the holdover time is only about 5 to 15 minutes, so the aircraft must take off immediately or else wait to be de-iced again. Type 2 and type 4 fluids generally provide a holdover time between 30 and 80 minutes. Type 1 fluids have a low viscosity and are considered unthickened. They provide only short-term protection because they quickly flow off surfaces after use. They are typically sprayed on hot, 130 to 180 Fahrenheit or 55 to 80 degrees Celsius at high pressure to remove snow, ice, and frost. They are used for de-icing. Type 2 fluids contain a thickening agent to prevent their immediate flow off aircraft surfaces. Typically, the fluid film will remain in place until the aircraft attains 100 knots, at which point the viscosity breaks down due to shear stress. This fluid is used primarily for larger aircraft. It can be used to both de-ice and anti-ice the aircraft. Type 3 fluids are intended for use on slower aircraft with a rotation speed of less than 100 knots. Type 4 fluids meet the same standards as type 2 fluids, but they provide a longer holdover time and have become the preferred de-icing fluid. It can be used to both de-ice and anti-ice the aircraft. When aircraft surfaces are contaminated by frozen moisture, they shall be de-iced prior to dispatch. When freezing precipitation exists and there is a risk of contamination of the surface at the time of dispatch, aircraft surfaces shall be anti-iced. Some contamination, such as frost, can be removed and the surface protected from refreezing, all at the same time using the same fluid and same mixture. This is called a one-step procedure. One-step de-icing, anti-icing is generally performed with a heated, unthickened fluid. Two-step de-icing, anti-icing, when the first step is performed with de-icing fluid, is a procedure performed whenever the contamination demands a de-icing process separately. After de-icing, a separate overspray of anti-icing fluid shall be applied to protect the relevant surfaces, thus providing maximum possible anti-ice capability. Aircraft may be de-iced and anti-iced at both the gate or at a remote de-icing location nearer to the runway. Flight crew procedures are defined by company policies and by the aircraft operating manual, but we can discuss some general considerations for crew actions during de-icing. They include proper aircraft configuration for de-icing and proper communication with the de-icing staff. To configure the aircraft, the captain should assure that the parking brake is set, packs are off, engines are not running, 
If APU is running, the APU bleed should be off and the flaps should be up. Proper communication is as important as proper de-icing anti-icing. There cannot be any doubt of the procedure. Fluid used, hold over time, areas covered, etc. when communicating and verifying the process. The person communicating with the flight crew shall have a basic knowledge of the English language in order to communicate properly. Pre-takeoff check. The captain shall continually monitor the weather conditions after the performed de-icing anti-icing treatment. Prior to takeoff, he or she shall assess whether the applied holdover time is still appropriate and or if untreated surfaces may have become contaminated. This check is normally performed from inside the flight deck. Pre-takeoff contamination check is used to check the critical surfaces for contamination. This check shall be performed when the condition of the critical surfaces of the aircraft cannot be effectively assessed from the flight deck or when the applied holdover time has been exceeded. This check is normally performed from outside the aircraft. The alternate means of compliance to a pre-takeoff contamination check is a complete de-icing, anti-icing retreatment of the aircraft. Holdover time, hot, is the estimated time for which an anti-icing fluid will prevent the formation of frost or ice and the accumulation of snow on the protected surfaces of an airplane under specified weather conditions. Holdover time is determined by the extent to which it is expected that applied fluid will remain active on the aircraft surfaces. Active fluid must be able to provide protection from the accretion of frozen or semi-frozen contaminants in the prevailing conditions. Holdover time begins at the start of the anti-ice operation. If a two-step operation is used, then it begins at the start of the final anti-icing step. By definition, therefore, holdover time will have effectively run out when frozen deposits start to form or accumulate on treated aircraft surfaces. Each fluid has a documented holdover time that is listed in a holdover time chart in the flight crew operating manual. Once the de-icing, anti-icing process is complete, the ground personnel will advise the captain of the start time for the holdover time. Holdover times are referenced from the holdover time chart in the operating manual. Type 2, 3, and 4 fluids contain a thickening agent, which enables the fluid to form a thicker liquid wetting film on external airplane surfaces. This film provides a longer holdover time, especially in conditions of freezing precipitation. With this type of fluid, additional holdover time will be provided by increasing the concentration of the fluid in the fluid water mixture, with maximum holdover time available from undiluted fluid. Holdover times could vary due to environmental conditions existing at the time, including high winds, jet blast, wet snow, heavy precipitation, aircraft skin temperature lower than outside air temperature, and direct sunlight. Welcome to Operations on Contaminated Runways Training. In this module, we will review operations on a contaminated runway, including definition of a contaminated runway, measuring runway braking action or friction, assessing runway contamination, performance effects of takeoff and landing on a contaminated runway, flight crew takeoff and landing considerations. The International Civil Aviation Organization defines a contaminated runway as a runway where more than 25% of the runway surface is covered by water, slush, dry or wet snow, compacted snow or ice, including wet ice. Braking reports are offered at towered airports via ATIS or ATC 
when runway and taxiways are covered in ice, snow, or water. Pilots or airport maintenance personnel who have used the airport's runways generate these condition reports. Most reports around the world are issued as a Breaking Action Report, or MU, Surface Friction Reports. Breaking Action Reports have values of good, fair, poor, and nil, while MU, Surface Friction Reports, have values of 100 to 0, with anything below 40 being reduced braking action. While there is no official correlation between the two standards, a rule of thumb is that an MU report of greater than 40 equals a braking action of good. MU of 40 to 30 equals a braking action of fair, and MU of 30 to 20 equals a braking action of poor, and an MU of 20 or less is equal to a braking action of nil. Incorrect runway surface condition reporting is a common theme in contaminated runway incidents. Airport personnel are trained to assess runway surface condition. However, this process may be open to a certain amount of subjectivity due to the variables associated with human factors. Runway conditions may not be uniform over the entire length. In dynamic meteorological conditions, runway surface condition assessments can become inaccurate very quickly. Once the flight crew has received the runway contamination report from the airport, it is important that the flight crew review the report and all other information available to them, including company reports, pilot reports, and their personal observations. This more complete data will then allow the captain to determine the safest course of action, including choice of runways, performance corrections, flap settings, delaying takeoff or landing, or, in the case of landing, diverting to a more suitable airport. Flight crews must understand the effects of contamination on the takeoff performance of their aircraft. When applying corrections to takeoff performance data, flight crews and dispatchers must use the most accurate and update runway assessment. Takeoff on a contaminated runway without corrected takeoff performance data should never be attempted. Contamination on the runway affects takeoff performance in many ways, including reduced acceleration, increased stopping distances, and reduced directional control. V1 or decision speed must be adjusted to account for the reduced acceleration and an increased stopping distance may limit your takeoff weight due to the increased accelerate stop performance. Please consult your company manuals and aircraft performance manual for further information. When taking off on a contaminated runway, flight crews should always consider the following. 1. Use max power. 2. Due to the reduced directional control, use the runway with the least amount of crosswind. Do not use differential braking or thrust for directional control. 3. In the event of an aborted takeoff, use maximum brakes and reverse thrust. Remember that the RTO setting on auto brakes will provide the maximum stopping performance. 4. Brief the takeoff procedure. Please consult your company manuals and aircraft performance manual for further information. Flight crews must understand the effects of contamination on the landing performance of their aircraft. When applying corrections to landing performance data, flight crews and dispatchers must use the most accurate and up-to-date runway assessment. Landing on a contaminated runway without reviewing landing performance data should never be attempted. Contamination on the runway affects landing performance in many ways, including reduced deceleration, increased stopping distances, and reduced directional control. An increased stopping distance may limit your takeoff weight. Please consult your company manuals and aircraft performance manual for further information. When landing on a contaminated runway, always land on the most suitable runway for the conditions. If able, 
choose the longest runway with the least amount of crosswind. The approach should be flown normally and stabilized. A firm touchdown is preferred. Do not float. After touchdown, lower the nose at a normal but deliberate rate. Use of auto brakes is recommended. Full ground spoilers and maximum reverse thrust should be utilized. Do not use differential braking or reverse thrust as this may induce a skid. Do not attempt to turn off of the runway until the aircraft has slowed to a slower than normal taxi speed. Consider leaving the flaps extended until ground personnel can inspect them for snow or ice contamination. As always, please consult your company manuals and aircraft performance manual for further information. Now, for a few questions. Welcome to Thunderstorm Avoidance. In this module, we'll review an introduction to thunderstorms, life cycle of a thunderstorm, the dangers of thunderstorms to aircraft, and techniques for avoiding thunderstorms. It is estimated that there are as many as 40,000 thunderstorm occurrences each day worldwide. This translates into an astounding 14.6 million occurrences annually. All thunderstorms require three ingredients for their formation, moisture, instability, and a lifting mechanism. Typical sources of moisture are large bodies of water such as the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, as well as the Gulf of Mexico. Air is considered unstable if it continues to rise when given a push upward or continues to sink if given a push downward. As this parcel rises, it cools and some of the water vapor will condense, forming the familiar tall cumulonimbus cloud that is the thunderstorm. Typically, for a thunderstorm to develop, there needs to be a mechanism which initiates the upward motion, something that will give the air a nudge upward. This upward nudge is a direct result of air density. Some of the sun's heating of the Earth's surface is transferred to the air, which in turn creates different air densities. Other things that can push the air up are weather fronts and terrain. The building block of all thunderstorms is the thunderstorm cell. Most thunderstorms undergo a three-stage life cycle cumulus stage, mature stage, and dissipating stage. The full life cycle of a thunderstorm usually goes by rather quickly and lasts about 30 minutes to an hour. In severe thunderstorms, this cycle is extended because of differences in the inflow of warm, moist air into the thunderstorm. If the updraft is slanted, then the rain that falls out of the cloud will not cut off the inflow of the moist air that is the thunderstorm's fuel allowing it to continue for a much longer time period. Some severe thunderstorms have been known to last for hours and travel at speeds up to 70 miles per hour. Although most cumulus clouds do not become thunderstorms, the initial stage of a thunderstorm is always a cumulus cloud. This is called the cumulus stage in the life cycle of a thunderstorm. The chief distinguishing feature of this cumulus or building stage is an updraft, which prevails throughout the entire cell. Such updrafts vary from a few feet per second in the early cells to as much as 100 feet per second in mature cells. A cumulus cloud begins to grow vertically, perhaps to a height of 20,000 feet, 6 kilometers. Air within the cloud is dominated by updrafts, with some turbulent eddies around the edges. Once a thunderstorm has reached the mature stage, it has considerable depth, often reaching 40,000 to 60,000 feet, 12 to 18 kilometers. Strong updrafts and downdrafts coexist. This is the most dangerous stage when large hail, shearing winds, and lightning may occur. The beginning of surface rain with adjacent updrafts and downdrafts 
initiates the mature stage. As the raindrops begin to fall, the frictional drag between the raindrops and the surrounding air causes the air to begin a downward motion. Since the lapse rate within a thunderstorm cell is greater than the moist, adiabatic rate, the descending saturated air soon reaches a level where it is cooler than its environment. Consequently, its rate of downward motion is accelerated, resulting in a downdraft. Downdrafts can change the temperature rapidly in an area in a short amount of time. Most thunderstorms reduce surface temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees because of evaporative cooling. In this phase, the most dangerous are the downdraft winds, where high-velocity winds are directed downward and then outward from the surface landing point. Several fatal and historic crashes have been attributed to the phenomenon over the past several decades, and flight crew training goes to great lengths on how to properly recover from a microburst wind shear event. These kind of events are called downburst or microburst. Time. That's a full-fledged microburst. Winds and microbursts can easily top 100 miles an hour. Uh, damage could be being done right now as we speak in this area, which usually is maybe a mile or two maximum across. But that is uh, sort of the classic signature of a microburst. In the dissipating stage of a thunderstorm, downdraft cuts off the updraft. The storm no longer has a supply of warm, moist air to maintain itself and therefore it dissipates. Light rain and weak outflow winds may remain for a while during this stage, before leaving behind just a remnant anvil top. But even the dissipating stage can be dangerous to aircraft, as the unstable air can still have significant turbulence and should be avoided. Thunderstorms represent some of the worst dangers in aviation. The effects they have are most likely to be found in the form of turbulence, downburst, microburst, tornadoes, icing, lightning, hail, heavy rain, surface wind gusts, runway contamination, low status, and bad visibility. Turbulence. Severe turbulence is caused by mixing of up and downward moving air and can be expected anywhere in and under the thunderstorm, even at distances of 25 nautical miles ahead of and 10,000 feet above the shower depending on its intensity. Downburst. A huge amount of cold air flows out of a thunderstorm causing a strong downdraft with a cross section of 2 to 5 nautical miles in center and horizontal wind shear and updraft around the center and with severe horizontal wind shear outside of the thunderstorm. The total affected area may have a radius of more than 15 nautical miles. The horizontal wind shear component may be as large as 6 knots per second over a period of 16 seconds, which exceeds the acceleration of any aircraft. Microburst. This is like a downburst, but on a much smaller scale, and with a cross-section of 0.5 to 2 nautical miles. The horizontal wind may average at 45 knots, with a maximum of 90 knots. It is very dangerous as the phenomena is concentrated over a small area. Tornadoes. These may develop under a shower visible by dust or moisture, but they can be invisible too when the air is dry under the convective condensation level. Typical horizontal dimension is several hundreds of meters and wind speeds of over 150 knots are not uncommon. Lifetime may last from several minutes to hours. Smaller types, like the water spout, have a radius of 25 to 50 meters and a lifespan of about an hour. Icing. Since the most severe icing occurs in an environment of supercooled water droplets, in a thunderstorm this will be between levels where the temperature is around zero and minus 23 degrees Celsius. Icing may also occur at higher level altitudes, near the top of the thunderstorm, where mixed water and ice particles may stick to the cold airframe. Hail. 
hail may be present in temperatures well above zero Celsius. The occurrence at plus 20 Celsius is quite normal. As hail is formed by a process requiring supercooled water droplets, it will typically be present in the lower and medium levels of a thunderstorm, since these droplets are scarce above the minus 23 degree Celsius level. Heavy rain. If rain is present in the lower parts of the thunderstorm, it may cause engine flameouts and reduced visibility from the cockpit. Gusty winds. This may cause heavy turbulence, severe downdrafts, and may exceed crosswind limitation of the aircraft. Wind gusts can be present in a range of 25 nautical miles ahead of and 15 nautical miles around a thunderstorm. Runway contamination. The presence of rain, hail, or snow may result in a poor braking action. As a thunderstorm is a relatively short-lived phenomenon, braking action coefficients are hardly ever measured, and actual braking action may be unexpectedly poor. Lightning. Aluminum aircraft are relatively safe from a lightning strike. An electrically charged aircraft, static electricity, can be detected by static VHF disturbances on the radio and or St. Elmo's fire. At this point, it is more prone to a lightning strike. To electrically discharge an aircraft, static wicks are used. They are connected to the airframe and release the electrons back to the atmosphere, thus reducing radio interference. Engine water ingestion. Turbine engines have a limit on the amount of water they can ingest. Updrafts are present in many thunderstorms, particularly those in the developing stages. If the updraft velocity in the thunderstorm approaches or exceeds the velocity of the falling raindrops, very high concentrations of water may occur. It is possible that these concentrations can be in excess of the quantity of water the turbine engines are designed to ingest. Severe thunderstorms may contain areas of high water concentration, which could result in flameout and or structural failure of one or more engines. Poor visibility. This will occur in heavy precipitation, fog, or stratus over high ground. Never regard any thunderstorm lightly, even when radar observers report the echoes are of light intensity. Avoid flying into or near to a thunderstorm is the best policy. Airborne weather radar, your best tool to avoid a thunderstorm. Airborne weather avoidance radar is, as its name implies, for avoiding severe weather, not for penetrating it. Whether to fly into an area of radar echoes depends on echo intensity, spacing between the echoes, and the capabilities of the pilot and the aircraft. The ability of airborne weather radar to detect weather phenomena is limited in both direction and range. Additionally, Weather radar detects only precipitation drops. It does not detect turbulence. Therefore, the radar display provides no assurance of avoiding turbulence. The radar display also does not provide assurance of avoiding instrument weather conditions from clouds and fog. A phenomenon called attenuation may exist when a cell absorbs or reflects all of the radio signals sent by the radar system. Attenuation may prevent the radar from detecting additional cells that might lie behind the first cell. This is often referred to as radar shadow. Remember that while hail always gives a radar echo, it may fall several miles from the nearest visible cloud, and hazardous turbulence may extend to as much as 20 miles from the echo edge. Avoid heavy or extreme level echoes by at least 20 miles. Such echoes should be separated by at least 40 miles. Consult your aircraft flight manual for the operating techniques and limitations of your specific radar system. Avoiding thunderstorms during all phases of flight and their hazards is critical for the safety of flight. This includes takeoff phase, en route phase, and the landing phase. Following are some things that you can do to avoid the hazards of a thunderstorm. Don't land or take off in the face of an approaching thunderstorm. A sudden gust front of low-level turbulence could cause loss of control. Don't attempt to fly under a thunderstorm, even if you can see through to the other side. 
Turbulence and wind shear under the storm could be hazardous. Don't attempt to fly under the anvil of a thunderstorm. There is a potential for severe and extreme clear air turbulence. Don't fly without airborne radar into an area of active or forecasted thunderstorms. Don't trust the visual appearance to be a reliable indicator of the turbulence inside a thunderstorm. Don't assume that ATC will offer radar navigation guidance or deviations around the thunderstorms. Listen to chatter on the ATC frequency for pilot weather reports and other aircraft requesting to deviate or divert. Ask ATC for radar navigation guidance or to approve deviations around thunderstorms if needed. Advise ATC when switched to another controller that you are deviating for thunderstorms before accepting to rejoin the original route. Ensure that after an authorized weather deviation, before accepting to rejoin the original route, that the route of flight is clear of thunderstorms. If you are unable to avoid penetrating a thunderstorm, the following are some techniques to remember before entering the storm. Tighten the safety belt. Put on the shoulder harness and secure all loose objects. Plan and hold the course to take the aircraft through the storm in a minimum time. Verify that anti-ice is on. Establish power settings for turbulence penetration airspeed recommended in the aircraft manual. Turn up cockpit lights to the highest intensity to lessen temporary blindness from lightning. Keep your eyes on the flight instruments. Looking outside the cockpit can increase danger of temporary blindness from lightning. Don't change power settings. Maintain settings for the recommended turbulence penetration airspeed. Don't turn back once in the thunderstorm. A straight course through the storm most likely will get the aircraft out of the hazards most quickly. In addition, turning maneuvers increase stress on the aircraft. Now, for a few questions. This module provides training on volcanic ash and the effect it has on aircraft. We will also describe how to determine if your aircraft has encountered ash and what you as a pilot should do in this situation. There are around 1,500 known active volcanoes located on all seven continents. There are also around 10,000 volcanoes located in the oceans. The red areas on this frame locate some of the known volcanoes. Volcanic ash presents a real danger to aircraft, and your aircraft can be many miles from an active volcano when ash is encountered. The highest danger imposed on your aircraft is that of engine failure. As of the date this CBT was created, approximately 90 commercial aircraft have encountered volcanic ash, and the seven of those 90 aircraft experienced an engine failure. Those seven would have ended in tragedy if the engines had failed to restart. Volcanic ash is a mixture of tiny particles of rock and glass no larger than 0 .08 inches or 2 millimeters. These small particles are created from the broken up solid rock and magma that has been cast into the air by volcanic eruption. Some reports indicate volcanic ash from a super colossal volcano has been carried higher than 82,000 feet or 25 kilometers above sea level. Once the ash is airborne, the wind can carry it several thousands of miles away from the location of the eruption. These ash clouds may stay in the atmosphere for several days to several years following an eruption. Volcanic ash clouds are very difficult to detect and are extremely difficult to see at night. Volcanic ash tracking is provided around the world, and this information is readily available to pilots and dispatchers. We'll provide some of the ash cloud tracking resources at the end of this module. 
You should know that volcanic ash is very abrasive and can cause external and internal damage to the aircraft. External surface damage may include scratched cockpit windows, light covers, and leading edges of the wings, tail, nose cone, and engine cowls. External ports and probes may become clogged and will then supply false readings to the cockpit. These ports and probes can affect everything from airspeed indications to cabin pressurization, engine thrust settings, and altimeter displays. Volcanic ash enters the engines and coats the components with a thin layer of a glass-like substance. This substance can clog fuel nozzles and restrict airflow through the engine. This damage may result in engine surge or compressor stall or even flame out. If ash remains in the engine, it will rapidly erode the moving parts and reduce engine overall performance. The ash can enter the cabin or cockpit through the ventilation system. Although the ash isn't poisonous, it can definitely irritate the skin, nose, throat, and eyes. Ash may clog air filters and disrupt the electronics and avionics cooling. If your aircraft encounters an ash cloud, you should notice some of these indications. A decrease in indicated airspeed, an increase in cabin altitude, a sulfuric smell, dust in the cockpit and cabin area, display of St. Elmo's fire, or a static discharge around the windshield, more visible at night, white glow surrounding the engine cowl, more visible at night. If your aircraft encounters an ash cloud, here are some of the common procedures. Don your oxygen mask, ensure it is set to 100%, and establish communication. Exit the volcanic cloud as quickly as possible. Retain your situational awareness. If your aircraft is equipped with auto throttles, disengage them. You will want to manually control the thrust in this situation. If at a sufficient altitude, retard the thrust levers to idle. This provides an additional engine stall margin and decreases the EGT. Immediately advise air traffic control of any diversion and the cause. Turn on the engine ignition to reduce the chance of flame out. Start the APU. Consider whether or not the APU may ingest the ash and possibly delay the start until clear of ash. Starting the APU provides a backup generator in case of engine flame out and also may be required to assist in engine start on some aircraft. Turn on engine anti-ice. This action allows more airflow through the engine. Close all pressurization outflow valves to keep the cabin altitude from rising. Turn off the air conditioning to prevent the ash from entering the cockpit and cabin. Do not use the windshield wipers because this action will scratch the windshields. This list is a simple guideline and it only provides things for you to consider. Of course, aircraft differences and situation differences will dictate a modification to this list. Always refer to your company's volcanic ash procedure if you encounter an ash cloud. The Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers, or VAACs, were created in 1995 to provide the aviation industry with information on volcanic activity and possible volcanic ash clouds that could interfere with the flight of aircraft. The VAACs communicate with meteorological agencies, volcanic observatories, and air traffic control centers to provide up-to-date information to the airlines. There are nine VAACs located in the world. They report volcanic ash advisories when a volcanic event occurs in their region. Notice the location of the nine VAAC regions and their headquarters. One of the most renowned examples of an encounter with an ash cloud is KLM Flight 867. This Boeing 747 was en route from Amsterdam to Anchorage with 231 passengers and 14 crew members on December 15, 1989. 
Over the North Pacific region, Flight 867 unknowingly entered an ash cloud from the Redoubt volcano that had erupted that same morning about 180 miles southwest of the encounter. Ash coated the engine components and caused all four engines to flame out. The aircraft dropped from 28,000 feet to 13,300 feet before the crew was able to restart two of the engines. Five minutes later, the crew was able to restart the other two engines. The damage to the aircraft was estimated at $80 million, but no lives were lost. We hope that this module provides you with a better understanding of the dangers of volcanic ash to an aircraft and that you are more aware of the tools to avoid and deal with volcanic ash clouds. Okay, you have this side on the uh, ash plume at Yeah, it's just cloudy. It uh, could be ash. It's just a little browner than the normal cloud, but... Uh... Radar was coined in the early 40s as an acronym for Radio Detection and Ranging. It describes a system that uses radio waves to determine and map the location, direction, and or speed of both fixed and moving objects such as weather in our study. A simple radar system consists of, one, a transmitter that emits the radio waves which are reflected by the object, Two, a receiver, typically co-located with the transmitter, that detects the reflected radio waves. And three, a display unit that presents the object's data to the operator. The objective of any aircraft weather radar is, one, determine the distance to an object, often called a target. Two, determine the position of the target relative to the aircraft. And three, Determine the target's reflection characteristics, often referred to as intensity. Let's see how it works. To find the distance to the target, we know that a radar wave travel time is 12.34 microseconds per nautical mile. When the radar unit transmits and receives, the time is recorded. The recorded time indicates the distance between the aircraft and the reflective particles. Let's take a look at the following example. The round trip for a target at 50 miles would be 617 microseconds. To find the target direction, the radio waves radiate from the surface of the antenna in a manner similar to a flashlight beam. When the antenna is pointed toward the target, the radar unit will receive a reflection from the target, as shown here. To determine the reflection characteristics or intensity of the target, the radar unit measures the target's size and reflection strength. It then interprets this size and strength and assigns a color code. In this example, green, yellow, and red are interpreted as light, moderate, and high intensity.
In this example, this is the type of radar display that one might expect when encountering light rain showers. Now let's see how the radar unit would display more intense weather, such as a thunderstorm. In this case, the display provides a slice view of the thunderstorm from a top-down view. Another display commonly encountered is ground clutter, in particular towns and cities. These types of targets provide excellent reflectivity. If your radar has a mapping overlay, these targets can be easily identified. Before we continue further, there are several key radar operation principles that need to be discussed. These include radiated beam, antenna gain, calibrated weather, weather attenuation, and tilt management. Understanding these concepts will enable you to make informed decisions on how to employ the weather radar properly. This example represents the concept of radiated beam. Notice that the most intense part of the beam is the center. This means that the most reflective part of the weather target should be viewed using the inner core of the beam width. The term antenna gain is often misleading. It describes how much energy leaving the antenna is focused in a particular direction. Antenna gain is the ratio of focused intensity to average intensity. Antenna gain is controlled by rotating the gain control out of the auto or calibrated position. It is highly recommended that the auto position be used because this position presets for optimum reception, which will display the best weather radar picture to the operator. The concept of calibrated weather means that a thunderstorm will maintain its accurate color code presentation regardless of the range, or more realistically, to the limits of the radar's capability. To accomplish this, three things are required. A reference thunderstorm, a way to compensate for space loss, and a way to compensate for beam filling. In order for the airborne weather radar industry to calibrate their systems, they needed a reference thunderstorm. After considerable thunderstorm evaluation, they agreed on the above model. The system has to also compensate for space loss. As the radio waves travel to and from the target, most of the energy is simply not retrievable. That is because the energy goes into directions other than where the target and radar are located. Here is an example of how it works. The radar system has to also compensate for beam filling. Here, the radar beam may be much smaller than the storm. The radar unit compensates for both space loss and the effects of beam filling by producing a constant color-coded storm regardless of range. It does this with sensitivity time control, or STC, which adjusts the level of color thresholds. Weather attenuation describes a condition where the signal's strength that exits the target area can be significantly reduced, particularly in a strong storm. You can see that each raindrop scatters some of the energy and returns some, but most of it is simply lost. Let's look at an example of how weather attenuation would be depicted on the radar display. Notice the shadow, or attenuation, behind the thunderstorm. Cities do not create shadows because they are good reflectors of energy. Now let's examine attenuation in mountainous terrain. 
Here, the large mountain also creates a shadow to the rear on the display. Using what we have learned so far, let's see how we can apply this for finding hazardous weather with the radar. First, display plenty of ground return and look for an apparent radar shadow. Second, look forward of the shadow to see if a storm is present. To make sure that we are getting this correct, let's review another set of radar displays. First, look for the potential shadows. Then secondly, look for a thunderstorm in front of the shadow. See how easy this is? Tilt management involves locating the proper antenna tilt angle that will yield the most reflective area of the thunderstorm. The proper tilt angle is largely dependent on the aircraft altitude. For aircraft that are taking off, an initial 4 degree upward tilt should be set. Aircraft landing and to altitudes of 10,000 feet usually require a tilt setting of 2 to 3 degrees upward tilt. For mid altitudes, 10,000 to 35,000 feet, antenna tilt should be roughly 0 degrees or slightly down. For overland operations, Adjust the tilt until a small arc of ground return appears at the outer edge of the display. For high altitudes of 35,000 feet and above, the recommended tilt angles are listed here. At longer ranges, it will be difficult to obtain ground targets at the outermost area of the display due to the curvature of the Earth. Another method to find the optimum tilt angle regardless of altitude is to optimize the radar presentation. To do this, first, maintain the storm's calibration, and second, remove as much ground clutter as possible. Here is a depiction of how this is accomplished. Now let's discuss the nemesis of airborne weather radar, stratus rain. Stratus rain usually occurs at altitudes below 12,000 feet, and when viewed from high altitudes, ground reflections are mixed with the weather returns. Once the aircraft descends to a low enough altitude to point the antenna in a direction where the ground clutter is eliminated, then the radar can be used to circumnavigate the heavier areas of rain or embedded thunderstorms. If the radar operator does not fully understand this limitation, one can easily lose confidence in the radar's capability. Before we complete this module, let's review a systematic approach that will ensure you the best possible chance of locating hazardous weather. This approach uses a four-step technique. Step 1. Search for weather targets by looking for shadows while displaying considerable ground clutter. For this display example, no weather targets are present. Step 2. If you detect a shadow, adjust the tilt control to maximize the weather target while accepting a significant amount of ground clutter. Step 3. Adjust the tilt angle up until you start to lose the weather target's strength. Notice that in this example, the beam is above the storm's dangerous core. Step 4. Tilt down the antenna to re-maximize the weather target while minimizing the ground clutter. That completes the procedure. See how easy that was?